Good evening. I'm Kevin McCabe, and this is Westchester Newsline. Well, a lot of people are waiting for their tax returns in the mail, and tax reform is a big issue nowadays. So we decided on Westchester Newsline tonight to have on a certified public accountant. In addition to that profession, he's also representing the 20th Congressional District in Congress. Our guest tonight is Jody Aguardia. Congressman, thanks for coming to Newsline tonight. Nice to be here, Kevin. All right, the first question. What about President Reagan's tax reform proposals? Where do you stand on it? Very much for tax reform, as I said during my campaign and, and afterwards. Uh, we have a, an internal revenue code that is very complex, uh, perceived by many to be uh, unfair, and I believe uh, will retard economic growth in the long run. So I don't think there's any question that we need tax reform. Uh, I think we've got to be careful, especially here in New York State, with the current package. Uh, I will fight tooth and nail with the rest of the New York delegation, that includes the senators, uh, Senator Moynihan and Senator D'Amato, against the elimination of the state and local tax deduction, uh, especially the real estate tax. I'm really surprised right. that they put that real estate tax in there as well. Uh, just think about Westchester County. Uh, the real estate tax uh, funds over 80 percent of the public school education in this county. The elimination of that tax uh, will play havoc with the real estate values and the public school system itself. So uh, we've got to take a very hard line against that particular item. And Kevin, it's going to be tough because the last estimate uh, that I read, I think it was this morning, uh, is that that amount uh, comes to, or that one item comes to $34 billion. And that's a big hole to be left in the budget. Uh, but I think we've got to do some creative thinking. And uh, if for some reason uh, we find that politically we are in the minority, and that's what I'm hearing, that states like New York, California, Illinois, and a few of the other northeastern states. How are you going to fight that now? You say you're going to be working with Moynihan and D'Amato on that. How are you going to go to the rest of the states and say, okay, well, this might be good for your area of the country, but I'm coming from Westchester County, and Jody Aguardi has to go back to Westchester and say, look, we're using those taxes for our kids and for education. How are you going to put that across to them? Well, I'd have to use a, a common sense argument, and uh, let me share one with you, that uh, New York State is uh, special and that it provides services that other states do not provide, and uh, sure, we have a high taxing jurisdiction, uh, and maybe that tax has to be reduced, but we need some time. And you can't just in one year take away a uh, state and local tax deduction that's going to affect this state uh, right to its core. Uh, and I would say that, uh, number one, uh, we should argue that they shouldn't tamper with the real estate tax deduction, because that affects just about everybody. Uh, and when it comes to the other, I would say, hey, give us five years, maybe ten years, to phase it in. And uh, maybe in the first year we can't have a, a tax rate of 35%. Maybe it should be uh, 40 and it comes down to 35% as the state and local deduction or part of it gets phased out. Now, I think New York State needs time to deal with this, if in fact that's the objective, to get states like New York to reduce their taxes. But to do it in one year, to me, is ridiculous. And uh, it's just going to be too much for this state to bear. I'll, I'll mention one point. Uh, in the last census, we lost 700,000 people in this state. Uh, we can't afford to lose that many people in the next census. Uh, we lost five congressional seats, as I recall, and Florida picked up four. Now, the cost of government does not go down when people move out. Uh, at the least, it remains the same, which means you're spreading the cost of government over fewer people. And that encourages them to, them to leave, and we, we can't have that. We, we've got to be careful here. Congressman, you're very proud of the fact that you're a certified public accountant. And we were talking earlier about the issues of the times. Right now, it's tax reforms. Are people in Congress listening to you? You are, you are a freshman congressman. Mm -hmm. How do people listen to you when you say, I'm Jody Aguardi, and I'm a CPA, and I'm talking about this, and this is my background? Well, several times, Kevin, I got up on the House floor just, um, well, I guess it was last week or the week before, right after the debate on the, the, budget, um, uh, the budget resolution. And I voted against every budget resolution. Democratic, Republican, for good reason. I came close on, on one of them. I wanted to make the point that as a certified public accountant, not necessarily a congressman, I didn't like the way the budget was constructed. And I said, and this is on the floor of Congress, uh, would you build your, a house from the top floor down? Obviously you wouldn't. You would work from the foundation up. And yet the budget process that I've seen constructs a budget from the top floor down. What, what do you mean by that? Constructs well, they, it from the, from the top down. The, the basic focus is what did we spend last year? And then they'll say, well, let's add 5% or subtract 2%. And to me, that's not the way to do it. Uh, it's important to know what we spent last year, but that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is, how did we spend our money last year? Let's go back to the first dollar. It's called zero-based budgeting. 
the fact that we spent money last year should not become the baseline for the future. We should look at what works, what doesn't work. And what doesn't work, we should get rid of. What works, we should make better. Uh, and even a freeze, uh, in a sense, is good, uh, let's say initially. But if you have a freeze mentality for too long, what are you doing? You're freezing in the waste. Because if we acknowledge that there was waste last year, and we're saying that's the baseline for the future, we have frozen in the waste. What was the reaction of other congressmen to that? What did they say to that, especially people who have been there for years? Well, you know, many of them came up to me afterwards and patted me on the back and said, Joe, you know, you made some good points. I don't think that uh, congressmen and uh, other people that I've met in Washington are used to this kind of questioning, this kind of thinking, but that's the thinking that I'm going to bring to bear as a congressman uh, representing not only this district, but the country. I feel it's important uh, that I bring to bear my training as a certified public accountant for 22 years. Mm -hmm. And a CPA just doesn't do superficial quantitative analysis, which is what I've seen in four months. A CPA does a lot of qualitative thinking, getting under the numbers, what works, what doesn't work. And that's what we have to do. It seems you've got your, your work cut out for you here. Uh, Very Rich much so. Richard Ottinger, your predecessor, when he retired, one of the reasons he gave was that he felt he, wasn't, he couldn't get enough done in Congress. How do you feel about that? Could you possibly burn out on something like this? Or do, do you see any ways now where you, you think Congress is moving too slow? Or is Congress is acting in a way that, that they shouldn't act or they're not acting at all? Well, I think the, the answer for Joe Diaguardi is to continue to get on shows like yours, Kevin, and uh, to get around the, the country and tell the public this story. Because the real power is really with the public. We saw what happened uh, when they tried to withhold uh, taxes on the interest in the banks. Mm -hmm. uh, millions of letters came in, and that law was repealed. Recently, we had it with the automobile log, the contemporaneous log. That law was repealed. I think the public needs to be educated and become uh, or made more aware of what's going on. And if they begin to understand that we have an accounting system in government uh, that the SEC would not allow you to use if you had a public company, in fact, they might arrest you if you used that accounting system, uh, I think they begin to ask more questions. And using a cash basis, allows the government to disguise uh, a lot. And as you know, we're passing on to our future uh, generations, our kids and grandchildren, a lot more than the one trillion seven hundred billion in debt. That's what we've bonded. There's another 3.5 or 3 trillion that is um, unbonded. It's called uh, unfunded pensions, uh, undisclosed liabilities, off balance sheet and off budget items. And as a CPA, I want to alert the public that we have a system that uh, if, if continued, could undermine the very strength of this country. What role should the government take in an area like Ohio, where the banks suddenly go under? There's people standing in lines and the banks aren't opening up. Everybody says that can't happen there. A thing almost similar to that happened a few weeks later in Maryland. I mean, people are all, all of a sudden they're stopping to say, hey, it's not going to happen here. You're a Republican, you ran with conservative backing. What role should the government play in, in areas like that, especially financial areas? Well, I think we have to be careful where the government steps in to bail out the private sector. Uh, but I am not totally against that. As you can see, it worked out fairly well with New York City, although I contend it was the real estate markets that, that really bailed out New York City. But the Continental Bank, now that was an important one because of the psychological impact that would have had on the rest of the banking system. I feel the same way with these other banks, that the government has to do something. Uh, we can't allow a domino ripple effect to affect the banking uh, industry. Uh, and I haven't looked at that uh, uh, closely at this point to, to give you a real value judgment on it. I'm not on the banking committee. But it seems to me that where we have a problem in the banking system, uh, we have to be doubly on guard that it doesn't affect uh, the confidence of the public in, in the system. Last Saturday, Vice President was in Harrison at uh, Arrowwood for a fundraiser for you. In his speech, he mentioned the position of the Reagan administration in Nicaragua. Now, outside of Arrowwood, out on, on the road, there was about 50 demonstrators out there, um, and they, they had their position on it. What's your position? You know, I met with many of those demonstrators in my, my office, and um, I spent uh, quite a bit of time understanding their position. And uh, my position for the vote to support the Contras was re really not formed until the very last minute. Um, I wanted to hear all the sides. In fact, uh, we did have some briefings by the CIA on the issue. And I came down on that issue as a national security issue. I didn't see it uh, necessarily as Contras versus Sandinistas. And I, I saw enough um, atrocities committed by the Contras themselves. But what I did conclude after seeing the size of the air base that was being built in uh, 
by the Cubans and the, the Soviets in Nicaragua, and some other things that were shown to us at a private briefing, is that we're facing a very clear national security issue in Nicaragua. We already have a launching pad for Soviet aggression in Cuba. Uh, Nicaragua would now provide one on the West Coast. Uh, and when you're talking about those Caribbean sea lanes, where 50% or more of our uh, strategic goods for NATO allies come, come through those sea lanes, I think that we've got a real interest there, and it's close to the United States. Now, we're talking about $14 billion. It wasn't like MX, which I did vote against. We were talking about a billion five. Now, I felt that $14 million uh, was not a big price to pay to stop the Soviets from consolidating their power in Nicaragua. I do believe that the ultimate solution there is the Contador process to strengthen not only Nicaragua, but the countries around it. The problem is an economic problem, and, and that is the intermediate long-term solution. And I don't see supporting the Contras as mutually exclusive of that solution. I see one as complementing the other. I, I had a smile when you said that, when you, when you turned around to an economic issue. Someone told me a joke the other day. It's making the rounds. If you want to know where Joe Diaguardi stands on an issue, you don't have to ask him. Just look at the bottom line. That'll tell you where. It's true. Uh, you mentioned that you took a long time to make your decision on that, right up until the vote, and you also mentioned that you got some CIA briefings on it. One thing I, I was wondering, where do you get your information to make these decisions? Do you, you get CIA briefings, State Department briefings. How do you get your information, and where does your information come? Well, information comes from other congressmen who sit on committees that are privy to information that other congressmen would not necessarily get. Uh, we do have uh, Republican caucuses where the issues are discussed. And from time to time, as we did on MX and uh, the Contra vote, uh, the White House will invite several congressmen in uh, for a briefing from Bud McFarland, the National Security Advisor. And in this case, on the Contras, they had uh, people from the uh, CIA. So that uh, I think that we get a lot of information, uh, but not being one that's on the Armed Services Committee or on the um, uh, committee in charge of the CIA, um, I've got to rely in good part many times on, on what I'm told by other congressmen as well. I think if Senator Robert Taft Sr. came back to life today and he saw some of the conservative ideas and principles going around, he might be a little <coughs> bit shocked. We, we don't have the oceans to defend our country anymore, but we do have a rather large defense system. I don't think anybody can push us around. We shouldn't be intimidated by anybody. Why do we have to give money to any of these countries, to, to El Salvador, uh, to Nicaragua, the, the, the rebels in Nicaragua, the government in, in El Salvador. Why should American money even be going into those countries at all if these people are, if, for whatever reason, if they're killing each other? I think the, uh, the answer has to be national security. It's where our national security is threatened that we should be supporting uh, uh, those countries. I, I think in the long run, obviously, we want to support them to make them better economically as, as neighbors so we can trade. I, when we trade with them, we'd like to get repaid. Uh, right now, as you know, there are many loans uh, that are outstanding from those countries to, to our country. So it's important for us to, to make them strong for many reasons. But where our national security is at stake, I think we have an added incentive to uh, poke our nose in, as we did with uh, Grenada. Papandreos just won a big election in Greece, and he's talking about taking American bases out of there. How do you feel about that, especially since we're talking about national security and defense? How will that affect us? That's going to be a, a tough one, uh, because we, we want to be sure that our NATO allies, that net is a strong one. Now, uh, I know that uh, with the Turkish government, we do have a strong uh, NATO ally there, uh, so I'm not totally upset by that. But I am upset that we, we have this undermining of the NATO alliance, so to speak, and that we've got to be careful that this does not set uh, a trend. About his position, I heard him say on the news, well, he lived in this country for 20 years, he said, uh, I, I don't want the Americans here, but I don't want the Russians here either. I mean, you can understand his, where he's coming from on mm -hmm. that, can't you? And, and can you blame him for it? Well, again, it's, uh, I guess, self-interest, but um, I think in the long run, uh, Mr. Papandreou should realize that the United States is the, the uh, last bastion of democratic freedom in the world, uh, or at least the, the greatest bastion of democratic freedom, and that uh, in the long run, uh, it's our strength and the strength of our allies that's going to determine the, the safety of the world. Uh, one has to wonder why the Soviet Union is building up such a, a massive uh, armed uh, force. Uh, when you consider they have three times more missiles than we do, um, five times more tanks, many more ships, uh, and they consistently put 
more of their gross national product into military than any other, other country except Israel, which fights for its survival every day, uh, one has to wonder what their true uh, motivation is. Okay. Speaking of democratic freedom, we're going to go to some of that right now. We'll be back after this message. Stay with us on Newsline. The weather is beautiful this time of year. Birds, sun, sky. Now is the time to have your heating system checked out so you'll be ready for next winter. Hillcrest Oil & Gas has the reputation for doing the job right, the first time. And if your heating bills are getting costly, Hillcrest welcomes the opportunity to survey your heating system and show you how to save 30 to 40 percent with a new, more efficient system. Whether it's oil or gas, Hillcrest can handle it. Hillcrest, the leader in oil and gas installation, service and repairs in Westchester for over 50 years. Alcohol abuse. It hits you right where you live. Shattering families. Shut up, Jennifer! Leave her alone! Get out of my way! Turning our highways into battlefields. Dispatch, this is 165. We've got a fatal. Send the crew. Roger, 165. Alcohol abuse. It doesn't have to hit you where you live. Give your town a fighting chance. Call 1 800 ALCALS. Good evening and welcome back to Westchester Newsline. Our guest tonight is Congressman Joe Diaguardi. Congressman, a few months ago, you were in the paper. You took a stand on, on an issue. Now, you went there as a Republican, and you won with the president, and you, you support the president on a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. A very important issue that came up this year was the MX. You did not vote with the president on that. Why? The um, answer is really not a simple one, but I did campaign uh, if you will recall, Kevin, heavily against MX. Uh, I didn't feel it was a, uh, a common sense way to be spending our money. Uh, think of the history of MX. It came up during the Carter administration, if you will recall, and they were debating about putting it on uh, railroad cars. Uh, here it is seven years later, and we now are going to commit a billion, five hundred million dollars for the first segment, and uh, we're talking about putting uh, MX in a hardened silo. We're talking about a weapon that has ten warheads, a weapon that's perceived by the other side, the Soviets, as destabilizing, a weapon that could very well invite the response it's designed to prevent because we're talking about a, a system that's uh, stationary, and we know the Soviets could knock it out. They've got the weapons to knock it out. Uh, I don't want to be without uh, a missile system. In fact, I've always said that I want a strong defense, not a spendthrift defense. Uh, what I wanted to see was our money put into the midget man system, which is on the drawing boards right now. I'm told it's five years away. Without technological edge and the money that they wanted to commit to midget, uh, to MX, that could be accelerated. Now, midget man has one warhead. It's mobile, much less destabilizing, uh, obviously much less vulnerable, and we're going to have it. And my conclusion is, can we afford both? Now we're going to have midget man, and I understand it's now going to be reduced some, excuse me, MX, it's going to be reduced somewhat. Uh, and we're going to have uh, Midget Man. Can we afford that at a time that uh, every dollar is precious to us because of the size of our, our deficits? We know that the Soviets right now have two mobile missiles, SS-24 and SS-25, and they're in the uh, process of deploying those missiles. So I would say that uh, seven years has gone by, and to be now committing that kind of money to a stationary system just did not make common sense to me. What kind of pressure were you under when, when you made that vote? Here you are, a freshman congressman, a Republican, elected and supporting the president on a lot of issues. What did the leaders of the party say to you? I mean, what, what kind of pressure were you under to go along with that? I mean, there were, everybody was under a lot of pressure. It wasn't just you. There was a lot of arm twisting going on. But what about yourself? Well, there was a, a lot of pressure. Uh, I wouldn't say that they twisted my arm, but I, I was invited in to have a one-on-one uh, -on -one meeting with the president. What did the president say to you? Well, he was very cordial, and by the way, he's a great guy, even in person. Uh, it's not just what you see on television. Even when you're voting against one of his uh, <laughs> proposals? Well, he was very persuasive. Obviously, they were tying this into the Geneva talks, but I felt strongly it was the strategic defense initiative, which I am for, uh, that brought the Soviets to the table and not the MX missile. Uh, but I tried to be as open-minded as I could throughout the whole discussion, and uh, I realized that it was going to be uh, very close. But I... Uh, told the president that uh, it was something that I had campaigned against and I felt my credibility was very important. And I said, uh, Mr. President, the alternative to uh, Jody Aguardi in my district is someone who will probably vote against you every time. Uh, I may be voting against you once, 
maybe twice. Uh, and, what was uh, his reaction to that? Well, he, he smiled, but he still felt strongly it was uh, important to the Geneva talks to, to have the MX. And I told him that I would keep an open mind right up to the vote. But uh, as, you, as you know, I, I voted against it. On the deficit, that's, that's one of the issues of our time right now. And the big issue. The, the big issue, right. Um, was it fair for the president to take the stand he did on, on freezing Social Security increases now, especially in light of what he said during the election? Was it fair for him to do that? Well, I, uh, you know, I'm totally against any freezes in Social Security. Uh, and let me just go over my formula for the deficit. It was to freeze, and I announced this three months ago, and uh, I'm delighted to see how close the, the formula was coming to what I announced three months ago, to freeze the domestic program, not emasculate those programs, in uh, nominal dollars, no inflation, uh, to freeze the military in real dollars, a 4% increase, which is what the Senate had come down on, and leave Social Security alone. Don't touch the COLAs because there are too many people, uh, more than 90, perhaps 95% of the people need every dollar. They don't get reimbursed for uh, prescriptions and drugs, and we know that medical costs are increasing at the rate of 10%, uh, while inflation is 4 So by changing that, we're going to create a new class of, of poor people. Uh, and I said, hey, what we've got to do is look at the programs qualitatively. Uh, which ones work, which ones don't work. For instance, take the Small Business Administration. Everybody was saying, let's cut this, the SBA out. Mm -hmm. uh, I say, no, the SBA worked fairly well. What doesn't work is the direct loan program. The default rate was too high because government is not good at being a banker. So that's the part of the program we should get rid of, but enhance the other part of the program. What, what, what do you mean the government isn't good at being a banker? What well, do you mean by that? Because the government doesn't have the expertise that bankers have. So allow the banks to make the loans and let us guarantee them. Okay, but the SBA had both programs, and we know that the direct loan program was not working that well because of the high default rate. Mm -hmm. Same thing with student loans. Let, allow the program to work. Enforce but would it. the banks be making those loans without the government being right there? I mean, it, it seems to me they have to go hand in hand True. somehow. Well, well, that's why I want to see that part of the program strengthened. Let the banks make the loans with the government guarantees, but let not the government be making the loans directly. There were two parts to the program. Mm -hmm. So I say bolster that part that involves the banks. Yeah. Right. And you can go down this program by program and uh, come up with areas that we could cut selectively. And really, the other big area, when you think about it, is the interest that we pay. We're going to borrow this year $155 billion to pay the interest. We don't have the money to pay the interest in our debt. Now, think about well, what that. What is that interest on? What is that interest on? That's, it. That's the interest on a trillion, five hundred, uh, it's going to a trillion, seven hundred billion dollars worth of bonds, treasury bonds, treasury bills. Okay? Now, the interest rate today is 10 percent, and, uh, and I'm happy it's 10. It's, it's dropping. Mm -hmm. But why isn't it 6 and 7? The bankers will tell you that interest should only be 2 percent over the inflation rate. It's not 6 or 7 because the people, the public, does not believe that government is going to get its act together. They're hedging already against renewed inflation and uh, high interest. We've got to knock that perception out. The way we do it is to come up with a plan to balance the budget over a period of time. You can't do it in one year. Mm -hmm. and, and, and probably, uh, a balanced budget amendment is needed. If we had that kind of structural discipline in the system, I think you would then see the interest rates drop. If the interest rates drop from 10 percent to 7, you know what that would say? 50 billion of the 150 billion. Now we're, we're on a roll. We can get a self-fulfilling prophecy and maybe balance our, our books a lot faster. So I think it's important to, uh, when, when you say Social Security, I am dead set against anybody touching Social Security. I think we've got to go to where the problem is. We should not hold the youth of this country, and that means expenditures on drugs and whatnot, uh, the drug abuse, nor the senior citizens of this country hostage to the budget crisis. The problem is waste, inefficiency, mismanagement, and all the things that um, one should look at when one measures whether or not we're being accountable as congressmen to the public. There's been talk lately that some of the Teflon has been, has been scratched off President Reagan. Um, he's had some close votes in Congress. The, the trip to Bitburg was, was probably a low point for him. Um, this is your first time in Congress, but, but do you sense anything from your colleagues or from any other areas that maybe his power isn't what it was one, two, three years ago? Has, has the lame duck uh, effect begun, begun to affect the president now? Is, is he not as powerful as he was? I don't see it, Kevin. I see a lot of discussion on that. Um, and I think uh, we saw uh, President Reagan at his, at his best uh, with the tax reform bill. Uh, and I think that was an historic moment. I think he uh, took up the, uh, the charge on a very key issue. 
And uh, I do not see the president as a lame duck. I see him as someone who is very popular, very well respected uh, for who and what he is. He's, he's an idealist, and he's trying to uh, bring this country uh, back on stream to where it belongs, to give it some uh, internal strength and to make government more manageable and to put more of government back closer to the people where it belongs. I've always said that when you try to send money through Washington and, and it comes back, too much sticks to the hands because there's a bureaucracy there. And I think what we've got to do is get government back closer to the people. And that's what President Reagan believes in, and that's what I believe in. You mentioned the president's personal popularity, and he transformed that popularity into getting a lot of things done. There really was a conservative revolution when he came to Washington. But the pendulum keeps swinging. Do you think maybe that conservative tide has now peaked and it's going the other way? I don't believe so. I think that um, there's, there's still a, a lot of momentum to get change in this country, and it's going to be tested with the tax reform bill. I'll say. Uh, tell us something about, well, before I ask you about your committees, you, you have gotten something passed already in Congress, and it deals, I think, with something locally here in Westchester. There have been a lot of teenage suicides in the past uh, two years, and you did something about that. Why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, a tough issue to discuss, but I think it's time that we took that issue out of the closet and put it on the table where we can discuss it. Uh, because there is a phenomenon. We, we lost 5,000 young people last year in this country to uh, suicide. Uh, and uh, I'm told by uh, professionals, psychologists and psychiatrists, uh, that uh, for every one that is successful, there's a hundred that, uh, that are not successful. So th there is a problem. Uh, the suicide rate nationally has remained uh, level in the last 25 years, but the teenage component has tripled. Uh, unfortunately, Westchester County is at the top of the list. This is what I'm told uh, in this uh, terrible statistic. So I think it's time that we uh, talked about what the problem is. Uh, this is a very affluent county, and uh, it, it's, it's ironic that we're dealing with an affluent county and we have this problem. But uh, we're in a very complex society today, and there's a lot of pressure being put on our, our, our children. And I think it's important to open up the dialogue with the children, with the parents, with professionals, uh, to give them some release for whatever these problems are. My bill uh, is to, uh, has named the month of June Youth Suicide Prevention Month, and I'm delighted to, uh, I understand I'm the first freshman to have a, a bill passed. It's not easy. You have to get uh, 218 signatures uh, to get a majority in the House, and, um, and we did that, and I'm delighted that the President uh, signed it. So what we need to do now is discuss this to find out why it's happening, uh, because we've got to pay attention to our youth. Congressman, thanks very much for coming on Westchester Newsline. Nice to be here again, Kevin. Okay. From all of us here at Cable 3 News, thanks for joining us. I'm Kevin McCabe. Good night.